This poetry jam is presented to you from the unceded indigenous lands of the Kanyangehaga Nation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Chochake, known as Montreal, has existed as a meeting place of many First Nation peoples, including but not limited to the Abenaki, Anishinaabe, and the Yurumwandat. I extend my deepest respect to the elders of these communities and to all indigenous people who carry the history of this island's lands and waters, caring for it and calling it home. We are honored and privileged to share stories on this land. Honor, respect. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Black Theatre Workshop's Poetry Jam. My name is Lizzie Dubisson, and I am uh, the Artistic Associate at Black Theatre Workshop. No, I am not your host. Uh, we have a wonderful host. I will introduce her to you very soon. But before we do so, um, I would just like to take a moment to say that, yay, uh, acknowledgement of everybody who supported us. Because today is the Poetry Jam, is the last live event of the season. We survived, we made it, we made it through the whole season. And because it's the last event of the season, we would like to say thank you. We'd like to say thank you first to our audience because we cannot do none of this without you. So thank you, audience. We love you. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for being with us. And we would also like to thank our sponsors, as you saw. Yes, the sponsors. Thank you for TD Bank for supporting us. Thank you for also to Canada Council of the Arts. Thank you for your support. Council, uh, le Conseil des Arts et Lettres du Québec. Merci beaucoup pour votre argent. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to thank Conseil des Arts de Montréal, Ville de Montréal. Thank you for supporting Black Theatre Workshop and making all of these activities and these events possible. Thank you for continuing for supporting us so we can come back with even more work. And again, to our most loyal and generous donor, thank you, TD Bank, for supporting Black Theatre Workshop. And now that we've done the thank yous and you know that this is the last live event, so hang on to it, sit down, grab your glass because now the hostess is about to come and start the event. So ladies, gentlemen, folks of all walks of life, let's welcome Adina Smith to the screen. Hello, Lindsay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I just want to say I'm taking your example. Oh! Yes. Because, you know, I'm just trying to be like you. <laughs> I'm just trying to be like you. I love you so much. I love you too. Thank you for that introduction. And now I'm going to go away and I'm going to let you do your thing. Have fun, all of y'all. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Black Theatre Workshop Poetry Jam. We are happy to be back at the mic. It is our last event of the season of the summer, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy. We are doing things a little bit differently, so we're going to have some surprises. And uh, I'm going get to get to sit back and relax a little bit, too. And so on that note, take a deep breath, sit back, and here we go. Hi, uh, my name is Rana Bose. I'm a Montrealer for about 45 years. I'd like to thank uh, the Black Theatre Workshop and Dina Smith for inviting me. Uh, I'm a writer, a poet, uh, and surprise, surprise, I'm also an engineer. Uh, I like to engage in uh, poetry that is of significance to the people I associate with and the general population. And um, it makes me enormously uh, happy to be here today and present some of my poems. Thank you very much. I'm gonna read a poem that I wrote in 2014 when Gaza was being bombed and 500 children were killed. It's called, I Want Winter. I want winter at this point, and I want winter back. I want the mist above the snow on a river below a bridge and nothing else. I want a lone pianist playing on a pier whose end can't be seen. I want him to play single notes 
on a long bridge with one note for every child and nothing else. I want the end of this summer of blood, dust, ripped banners, grimaces, anger, of coiled, hissing vipers spitting on friends who stand up alone against drunken militia on billions in dole. I want the mirth, the couches with beer, the lawless in their patio, on a hilltop cheering, foaming, darting around. I want them all gone. I want winter and nothing else. I want an endless pier, a bridge, a piano player, a hammer for a finger, playing one note for one child and nothing else. This is a poem called The Cosmology of Beat. It's been evolving since the late 70s and uh, all through the years, I've been revising and editing it. So the last edit was done a few weeks back. The Cosmology of Beat. In the Cosmology of Beat, there are backbent cars parked on roads, detritus beside lampposts. Rooftops above the five spot with curling smoke rising, rising from black gray still shots on walls of poetry on fire with desire. Uppermost in the narrow corridors of prized lofts going for cheap. Still shots of a messiah standing slouched, spouting, pouting defiantly on Wooster and Bleecker, mumbling, mumbling Sanskrit slokas, the sang de poets painted on the walls. Leroy Baraka, the lone gunfighter, pensive in a loft up there, or standing in the wings, or leaning against a piano that weeps and faints, that weeps and faints. As he begins to recite the tale of his baptism by Bob, in a black and white space, septic, surrounded by Peter and Jack, pounding on underwoods, fueled by whiskey, with handwritten labels. In the cosmology of Pete, there are black iron stairs that escape to below, that escape to below, where sulks a twist at the end of a martini, at the bottom of the glassy pit, empty as muffled horns screech to a cued stop for a jalapeno and chips and a squeeze break for the needy. In the cosmology of beat, the mind sits, armed only with a swizzle stick, swirling the dust from the Buddhist Tantra that makes the cosmos sound like physics gone to shit. In the cosmology of beat, there is hope that the hum and the swirl and the chance that a sound will emerge and bulbs will sway and faces will turn in corridors where whispers and chants once did ricochet. In the cosmology of beat, it is said that beats will come in technicolor, in ecta fucker chrome, beats from a bongo, a harp, a piano will bow jangle and bow beep from a sax on the edge of the metro, will tunnel down, will tunnel down and take you away in a whoosh, instead of the idiotic obsession with Om. Thank you. Hello. Hi, how are you? I am well, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for that beautiful and challenging work. I, uh, I've i heard the cosmology of beat before and I'm so happy to get a chance to hear it again. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, when I think about my work, I or I have to describe my relationship to my poems, I sometimes think of them as my children. None, of, Some of them are infants, none of them are older than a tween in my case. But I just wanted to ask you, how do you see your poems as entities separate from you yourself, and do you ever compare them in their development? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I've been through many transitions uh, in my poetry life, and uh, um, I was born in Calcutta in India. It's a city of uh, theater, uh, 
uh, and one of the influencers uh, at that time, the word influencer was not used really at that time, but anyway, his name was Badal Sarkar. He, he did a very minimalist kind of theater, uh, you know, uh, with uh, white cotton sheets as costumes, uh, shrouds, uh, used as shrouds, clouds, waves, uh, basic theater, but there was a lot of mockery uh, an absurdity that was used as a uh, tool. And in the early 70s, I came to St. Louis, uh, USA, to complete my engineering. And uh, when I came to St. Louis, my roommate, roommate was uh, Professor Arthur Brown, uh, a poet and a musician. He, he did his PhD on uh, the poetry and the songs of Buddy Bolden. And he worked in a blues environment. So he was my next influencer. He introduced me to blues poetry. And of course, then I uh, came to know, I, I had known Leroy Jones before when I was in Calcutta, his works. And, um, uh, and then later on, I got to know Gil Scott Heron. So, uh, I don't write poems as a routine. Um, it's not like when I write fiction, there's some discipline. Something hits me and uh, something unjust and, and I start hearing a beat in my head. Mm. And um, then, uh, so I work my words into the beat that I hear, uh, sort of attaching words to that beat. So, uh, that's that's been my process, but lately I've developed a style of my own, and and uh, uh, absurdity mockery is back on the front burner. Uh, it's uh, you know uh, as an act of defiance. Um, uh, I, I I've been told that I tend to be angry, but I think uh, um, I've. Uh, sort of evolved into anguish more than anger now. Thank you for that that explanation. And I, I absolutely understand that there is a lot to be angry about in the world. And the expression, if you don't laugh, you'll cry, makes sense to me so much. We are trying to hold each other and hold ourselves up. And so to mock and to, to be able to use some kind of uh, notion of the absurd in what we're seeing is really vital, really, really vital. Correct. I, as I said before, I love the work. I am thinking about the beat poets and you mentioned uh, Amiri Baraka or Leroy Baraka at the time. Were there any other influences or beat poets at the time who, who either the, you met or that had influence on your work? Yeah, there were, there were some people I'd met, but, uh, you know, they were not that well known. But, of course, um, Ginsburg was one. But, uh, but in general, I think uh, Amiri Baraka was a big influencer because he was also doing theater. And I came from a theater world, you know, mm. so... So uh, I'd say Amiri Baraka was pivotal. And uh, uh, don't forget that Gil Scott Heron also, uh, and Miles Davis and others, they also uh, engaged a lot with that village crowd, you know? And um, um, so uh, Gil was, uh, you know, long time uh, influencer uh, of the words I put together. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is, it's evident and it's beautiful. And I thank you so much for your work. We are going to uh, let you go for a moment and we're going to talk to you a little bit later. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, keep in mind those words and that energy. We have someone else coming up for you uh, in that new way that we're doing things for this Poetry Jam. Here we go. Hi, my name is Talia Malaika Urbani Ubarijuru. I've known Montreal and I consider it to be one, one of my homes and I've lived here all my life. I use poetry to help digest feelings that I try to turn away and hide and I use it to tell stories.
My name is Talia Malaika Urbani Ubarijuru, a muse of theater and comedy, a bridge between worlds, she who lives in the city, she who tells and listens to the story of the stars. I am the one who belongs everywhere and nowhere. My name is Petero Rubangura, son of Rutongo, son of Masoro, son of Rwandan land, the wise, caring elder I belong. We are part of the Avega clan, Iwachu Turi Avega. We are two souls hopping from one lily pad to another, each leap creating never ending wave patterns in the eternal pond co inhabiting our sisters, sons, siblings, children, ancestors, elders, destructors, unifiers. I try to grasp the sense of belonging, but it slips through my hands like a cat desperately trying to catch the moving laser beam. I, I leap, leap to, to a lily, lily pad. pad. My bare feet embrace the soft ground near my village and house. I am and will always be home. I, I leap, leap to a lily pad. pad. Where is my home? On a land? One, two, three, four lands? In a culture? One, two, three, four cultures? I, I leap, leap to a lily pad. pad. He who is part of I breathes what I yearn to inhale. I leap to lily pad. I who is he receives my questions only to bring me more. I leap to lily pad. Do I really know who you are? I leap to lily pad. Do I really know who I am? I dive into the water. The pond holds so much, so much. The roots of each lily pad dive down into the bottom of the pond in the cold, soft mud. My name is Talia Malaika Urbani Ubarijuru, a muse of theater and comedy, a bridge between worlds, she who lives in the city, she who tells and listens to the story of the stars. I am the one who belongs everywhere and nowhere. My name is Petero Rubangura, son of Rutongo, son of Masoro, son of Rwandan land, the wise, caring elder I belong. We are part of the Abega clan, Iwachu Turi Abega. I worry too much. I worry about everything and everyone and anything. I worry that the people I love will look at my shadows that never see my light. I worry that humanity will fall on its ego and land in its grave. And I worry that I worry so much. It follows me like the tide. When the sun keeps the sand and ocean warm, the tide is calm and welcoming. But when the moon rises and brings with it the tide, the water that used to tease the shore now envelops me. The present is a funny thing. It's always there, but I'm not always there. I sometimes dive into the past and try to tie a circle and a square together with glue. Or sometimes I try to peer into the future, but all I see are my fears and my dreams. I worry too much. I worry about everything and everyone and anything. I worry that life won't have my back if I give it my trust. I worry that people will break the walls I've taken so long to build. And I worry that I worry so much. I like to pretend I'm in control of everything. When in reality, I'm only in control of one grain of sand on life's beach. I try in vain to keep all the ocean in my grasp but the waves know better. My mind is a funny thing. It creates links through snippets of my life and comes to conclusions about things that never conclude. If I trip once, that doesn't make me unbalanced. If I'm not loved by people I wish loved me, that doesn't make me unlovable. I worry too much. I worry about everything and everyone and anything, but I'm trying to learn how to be present without diving into the past and seeking the future. I worry because I used to think worrying would help me stay in control. But life is like water. To follow it, you have to go with the flow.
When I close my eyes, I see Nana making tea, my cousins picking berries and my parents laughing at a forgotten joke. When I close my eyes, I see the mountains of Rwanda, yet I see not with eyes, but with blood. In darkness, I see my history, I see my now. My dreams know the land and the people. It knows the drumming that beats through each heart. I dream of people dying and names I've never known, but I know them. My dreams and blood and breath and heart know them. You say I don't belong, and I say I don't belong, but I grieve what you grieve. Our hearts both dance to the same rhythm of that land. When I close my eyes, I see Nana making tea. I see my cousins picking berries and my parents laughing at a forgotten joke. When I close my eyes, I see the mountains of Rwanda, yet I see not with my eyes, but I see with blood. In my darkness, I see my history, I see my now. I see the two branches of my heritage that blossom with flowers both colored with life and death. I hear the footsteps of children who couldn't make it past five. Their feet pound to the rhythms I know too well. They seek justice, they seek love, and through the voice you said didn't belong. Their story is told. I tell their story and hold their stories through my dreams. They appear in houses I didn't know I knew. They climb trees I didn't know I remembered, but I do. I see them. In darkness, I see my history. I see my now. Talia! Yeah. So beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank I you. am very, very impressed. And there were so many lines that jumped out at me and were so meaningful. You said, if I trip once, that doesn't make me unbalanced. That is profound wisdom for people of all ages. And if you are not loved by the people you wished you were loved by, that doesn't make you unlovable. Again, such um, depth in what you're saying and so relevant and so meaningful. So I'd like to ask you, I often make myself cry while I'm writing. I'm often writing from a place of needing catharsis. And so I just wanted to ask you, what other truths do you feel like have been revealed to you by your writing experience? Um, the thing I love about writing is that it actually helps me um, understand how I feel. And sometimes, most of the time actually, how we feel has so many roots and depths that we don't understand. And writing helps me see that. It, it's like my emotions are kind of like the canopy of the tree, but with writing, I get to see the entire tree and its roots. So um, writing in words has helped me understand a lot of things. It's helped me understand most things that I do understand. It helps me digest life and how I see life. Absolutely. Beautifully said. Beautifully Thank said. you. When we met, we talked a little bit about influences. So I just wanted to ask you who have been your writing influences and where do you see yourself in your journey? Where do you want to go? I have so many influences. Um, Maya Angelou, of course. I think she's helped me realize that um, you can be anything you want to be, but there's so many people who have shown me that too. My parents, my friends, um, people who have inspired me, Sam Cooke, Beyonce. There's just, there's so many people that have inspired me and has have helped create who I am today. Um, what I want to continue to do, um, anything that future Talia wants to do. I recently just finished my first book, which is really exciting. Thank you. Um, and I want to continue doing projects that are dear to me and just see how far I am possibly able to go with my dreams. I have no doubt it will be very far, very, very far. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. We will let you go for a little while, but we will talk to you after. So, 
so far I'm blown away and moved and feeling really grateful that I, again, have the opportunity to be in the presence of wordsmiths in the Black Theater Workshop space. We have some more for you. And so here we go. Bonjour, je m'appelle Rodney Saint-Éloi. Je suis poète et je suis éditeur de Mémoire d'un crier. Je suis arrivé à Montréal en 2001. Donc ça va faire presque 20 ans que je vis à Montréal. En fait, je suis poète dans la ville, je circule beaucoup dans la ville. Et un jour, il m'est arrivé de me poser la question, c'est quoi cette histoire de Black Theater Workshop Et puis j'ai été, et puis j'ai vu quelques, quelques spectacles. Et puis je suis content de ce que vous faites. Et je suis très content aussi que les Noirs s'organisent dans, dans la ville pour exister, pour respirer. Grand-mère Tida. Grand-mère Tida avait une tombe. Grand-mère Tida avait une maison. Elle préférait la tombe à la maison. Elle nourrissait la tombe de fleurs soleil. Elle s'arrangeait pour que la maison marche vers la tombe. La tombe était alors un jardin de lumière. Grand-mère Tida avait un cercueil. Grand-mère Tida avait un lit. Elle préférait le cercueil au lit. Elle parfumait tous les soirs le cercueil d'encens. Elle s'arrangeait pour que le lit soit au-dessus du cercueil. Le cercueil pouvait alors parler aux étoiles. Grand-mère Tida avait une robe blanche. Grand-mère Tida aimait sa robe blanche. C'était une robe de noces à volant. Grand-mère Tida ne l'avait jamais portée, cette robe. Grand-mère Tida attendait seule la mort. Elle chantait en lorgnant des yeux sa robe. « Quand la paix régnera au ciel, nous y serons. » Le son de choses en temps de révolte. La foule, le palais, l'assommoir. Toujours ce puits avide de sang. Le pouvoir a les mains insensées. La terre nourrit l'hystérie des hommes, les arbres filent la chimère des rues, les canons sont des cahiers d'écoliers, il fait un temps gris de trop de rente, un temps quadrillé de sang, il fait un temps idiot. Je reviens à la mer comme à la terre, comme l'amitié des lilas, comme qu'importe le hasard calfeutrant la digue des siècles, j'apprivoise en tes bras l'éternité de tous les bleus et ciel et mer en moi de semée. Enfant perdu dans la foulée des hommes, chèvre rebelle au troupeau, rebelle au troupeau, rebelle à moi-même. Dans ce jardin de raisons, de menthe, de cannelle, de parfum, de romarin, je revendique, je revendique la sorcière, la sorcière qui m'enfanta qui m'enfanta une nuit mauve. Je revendique la sorcière qui m'enfanta une nuit mauve. Je revendique, je revendique la libation. Je revendique la libation qui fit de moi l'orage des ciels d'octobre. S'il y a un homme, s'il y a un homme, c'est ma main libre qui rencontre le monde. S'il y a un homme, c'est ma main libre qui rencontre le monde. S'il y a une route, s'il y a une route, c'est mon corps aveugle qui cherche sa mémoire. Rue des hivers longs, quelle part de nous ira en notre île si nos amants, elles aussi, sont en exil Rue des cauchemars, plus longs que les sanglots, quel est le pain qui rompt la faim Quelle est l'eau qui étanche la soif Si joint mon premier amour, mon unique tremblement, post-scriptum, c'est du côté gauche que j'entre, c'est du côté gauche que j'existe depuis, les oiseaux habitent désormais tes prunelles. Je suis la fille du baobab brûlé, il paraît que je répète trop mon nom. Le délit, la terre humée a même la chair. Excusez l'absurdité de ma présence, je vogue, mère effrontée, l'histoire nomme les silences. 
et ma parole que je parle ma bouche, quand le vent traverse le vent, mets tes pas dans la limite de ton éternité. Accepte-moi comme la braise, accepte-moi comme je suis, à même le feu des forêts, à même les tourbillons de l'eau, à même la joie des villages retrouvés, à même les paraboles abolies. Je suis la fille du baobab brûlé, je suis nu avec mes légendes, je suis nu avec mes souvenirs, touché mes fesses endiablées. Les papillons connaissent le chemin, les poupées sous ma jupe baillent, touché mes grains de beauté, je suis incorrigible et belle, je suis l'oiseau de la nuit, je suis l'oiseau du désastre. Je suis venu belle et nue, je suis la fille du baobab brûlé. J'ai prêté mes fortes à ma nudité. J'ai donné le verbe donné à ton peuple. Entre nous est jeté ce pont de larmes. Aveugle, je lance mes fétiches et mes dictions. À la vindicte des hippopotames, je me réfugie aux portes de l'alphabet. Je n'ai pas de métier, je suis poète. Je suis la foudre qui dévisage l'avenir. Je n'obéis pas au calendrier de la peur. Je pleure mes amours et mes morts. Je suis la fille du baobab brûlé. Je n'ai jamais appris à compter. Je te parle des mots doux, poupées, abeilles, coton, cerf volant, pour fuir le malheur des mers. Les mots sont trop beaux pour contenir les naufrages et les phrases trop lourdes pour fleurir les tombeaux. Je te rejoins dans tes jeux d'enfant. De toi, je sais les choses simples, les mots gazelle, aubade et libellule, la soupe à l'oignon du poème, la lavande et l'eucalyptus de Marie, la couleur des mers au pays de ton père, l'enfance n'est jamais trop loin dans les éclats de tes rires. À la rivière Casimir à Cavaillon, la lavandière caresse les hardes. La lavandière bat l'eau, elle bat le sable. La lavandière foule la mémoire des fleuves. La lavandière parle aux amandiers bruns. Elle danse la danse Nago. Elle danse la danse Ibo. Elle danse la danse Petro, la danse du soleil qu'elle danse. Pivote noir, un battoir en bois de rose. C'est la tante Mercilia, la lavandière. Elle sait les chemins, la pleine lune, la rivière. Chante le peigne d'or, la reine Simbi levée. Chante, elle chante la sirène levée. Chante, elle chante la reine soleil levée. Et pour me consoler de mes chagrins, elle garde ma tête contre ses seins. Elle m'offre la citronnelle, la menthe. Elle m'offre le paye, l'or de Simbi, les astres, les prières, les dieux, les robes blanches de la rive, l'horizon au goût de fruits mûrs. Merci. Malheureusement, Rodney saint éloi n'a pas pu être avec nous ce soir, donc on vous envoie des remerciements. Rodney, pour tes mots, pour ton énergie. Et on, vous fait, on te félicite aussi pour euh, le nouveau recueil « Si nous ne trahirons pas le poème ». Félicitations pour le nouveau livre. Alors, on vous remercie beaucoup et énormément pour nous avoir euh, partagé les mots. We're going to move on with another surprise. Here we go. Hello, uh, my name is Justin. I'm a Montrealer, pretty much raised uh, in Montreal, although I moved around a lot. Um, I've been making poetry since I learned to write. Uh, I'm definitely an artsy kid more than anything else, and I've just started making music too. And I think my poetry and my music comes from sort of a philosophy of trying to find joy and heal and spread that kind of positivity in life that a lot of us uh, are sorely needing and also to explore my own sort of uh, pains and um, learn my lessons in life. So it's my own kind of tool to heal.
They tell you if the devil talks, never answer back. And they go flip the script on you like an acrobat. Acting like he'll never test you on the time as a crack. And he'll accept your darker thoughts if you just answer back. He's like a cancer the way he dances on every thought. And he'll romance you, keep you glancing at shit you bought. Shit, you thought you were stronger? You ain't got a shot. Now you ain't on the same level. The devil never stops. Oh, Lucy loves a romantic in you. She'll make you dance and have you chasing a hit of something at every chance. <laughs> Lucy don't like you being happy. Rest is draped in sin. When you feel rejected for your fuck-ups, Lucy takes you in. That's what it takes to win. Don't fall or take it in. Simple sense of acceptance, everybody sins. They say if God talks, you better answer back. I'm asking about the cancer. Let him answer that. Let him dance around the question like an acrobat, acting like he's only testing us so we can find the cracks. I find it funny how some money has me talking back. Cocky as a nigga can be, I'm just talking facts. Mindfulness. Mind forgets me. I mind the left cheek, but I keep turning. I'm getting a little bit dizzy. I'm getting fed up. You keep elevating stuff, I might learn to keep my head up. I hate this. Testing us so you can find the cracks. The best of us couldn't define the map. To greatness. I'm lying. You know how I love to fake shit. I know I'm bugging. Lately, it's just hard to trust. I guess that's faith, kid. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I heard you breaking. I know it's hard to see I love you when I'm always faceless. Wait. Is this real? Is this true? This is really you. This is as real as you decided to be. I can relieve a bit of pain if you confided in me. Well, I often tend to talk a lot. I got cautious thoughts, a lot. And I'm awkward. I ought to tell them where my heart is parked. I beep the keys and plead to you that I can find the spark. I just want to feel you in my darkest parts, in my awkward heart. Sometimes the sun shines brighter than most. These fears hold nothing to hope, dude. These tears ain't got nothing to hold you. Hold true. Old thoughts will rot quicker than most do. Up on that shelf you sit, what's the mystery? I'd listen sweetly if you told me nothing's every instancy. I'm mostly into knowing that you sit there. My reach to climb you is mostly just a line I cross to sit beside you. I wonder what simple lines you chew. There are lessons that you miss. You truly seem to float when others learn to fly. Learn to wonder why accomplishments will always take you high. Take to the sky when you get lonely and lost. What is the cost of cautious thoughts? This is for the misfits who needed a dream. For the kids and princes who needed a king. This for the queens who rarely get to hear they matter too. For black lives screaming for justice with an attitude. Mad at dudes, forget them. This pen missive isn't for them folk. This for the modern day slaves living in pens though. For better days can only live in your mental. And black lives could live or die by the pencil writing hope in the stencils. This for you if you decide to listen. For all your pain and your mistakes, it's all gonna be forgiven. It's always hard to tell the truth when you've been lied to, but try to. And don't you dry your eyes, everyone cries too. I do. They tell you, if your mama talks, then you should learn to listen. And don't you worry about the anger, it's all gonna be forgiven. It's gonna be the longest night if you don't learn to give in. Life ain't about the wrong or right, it's about the love you're given. This for sons and daughters, for mothers and fathers. Grandma's cooking up hope. Remember she taught us, it's all love. So mom, I love you, like the life you gave up. Trading all that potential, just so I could stay up. Just so I could show the world what I'm made of. I want to prove to you that even though the love is never perfect, it never hurts reminding you why all your pain was worth it. I love you. I don't even know what to say.
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I'm a mom that is beautiful and meaningful and powerful and thought provoking and tear jerking and uplifting all at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me and letting me uh, explore that poem with you guys. It was really fun. I am so happy that I had a chance to witness it. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about this journey uh, into poetry and your, you describe yourself as an artsy kid. And I just wanted to ask you about that. How do you contain or describe what happens to an artsy kid who is young and black and, and male and, and where does that, where does that sit for you? Uh, yeah, well, so, I mean, in my family, out of, uh, there's about four kids, and out of all four of us, like, I was the most artsy kid out of everybody. Um, and so I think that diving more into the arts is what allowed me to find my own expression uh, as a kid, especially with the stereotypes that you have when it comes to, um, well, to, to black males in general and the the kind of uh, barriers you have to put up, the vulnerability you're not allowed to show and so on and so forth. So I found that delving into my artistic journey has kind of given me the strength to find strength in those vulnerabilities. It's it's my ability to um, to to open myself up to weakness that I find pride in whenever I'm creating art. And, if I'm in a healthy state whenever I'm in my regular day-to-day -day life as well. So um, as much as there's a lot of pressures, I think I'm lucky to to have found that um, that healing process through art early enough that it's become part of my identity and then I can feel joyous no matter what I, uh, no matter what I, uh, that's my brother, <laughs> no matter what I kind of get, uh, show to the world, okay. what the world sees of me. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's an important thing I think for many young artists to hear is diving deeper into the thing that it, you are being told is not for you or being shown at least from some parts of the world is not for you. It's actually a way to find yourself and your tribe and, and your community that will support you. So in this journey, have you found mentors locally or outside of Montreal, people who have been able to, to pour into you, who, who are maybe ahead of you on this artistic journey? Yeah, of course. Um, I think theater itself, just kind of exploring that that medium has been one of the big mentors in, in discovering the power in owning your vulnerability and not being afraid of, of things that you would think would make you weaker, you think would make you scared. But um, over the course of, of my journey as an artist, like like Black Theatre Workshop for one, has been huge, huge, huge help in, in kind of like owning my own sort of artistic um, narrative and seeing kind of shows that I want to see or that I'm interested in or that I see myself in, so on and so forth, you know. Um, and, then, and then there have been sort of, because I, I, I grew up without my dad and there have been uh, men that I've met that have been in the industry that long enough that have that same sort of want for positivity and joy in life that have really kind of kept me stable and kept me clear on what it is I want to do with my art over time, other than exploring my own inner feelings and whatever. Um, I don't know if you were looking for names or so on, or if you just it's up to you. But... <laughs> uh, but, well, I don't know who knows who, I mean, Gordon uh, Mastin was one of my uh, teachers in Dawson. He was really amazing. Um, when I look at people like Quincy and Mike Payette, kind of just being super successfully bal I don't I mean, I'm assuming, but successful and balanced in their uh, in their arts that it kind of gives me the hope that I can actually achieve that in life and, and you know, make my goals step by step or whatever. Um, and then there's like superstars that uh, you know, famous people in, in my journey, like growing up, uh, I had Will Smith as an actor that I always loved for his love of life and so on. And there's musical artists that have kind of taught me to open up my soul in other ways, Chance the Rapper, Code of the Friend, so on and so forth. But yeah. 
thank you for sharing those names. And I'm glad you have them because it is a powerful thing to have people that you can look up to and, and emulate. And if you have them actually in your life, all the better. So I'm glad you found them because it is all the better for us through your work. So thank you. For sure, for sure. Thank you guys again. We're gonna let you go backstage for a little while and I will talk to you after. Perfect. Whew. So this has been a difficult year for so many people in so many ways. Um, many people have lost loved ones um, due to COVID, not due to COVID. People have experienced the inability to be together, to mourn the loss, to celebrate the life of. And the Black Theater Workshop family is no exception. We lost Dr. Horace Goddard within this period of time and we're not able to have the large and enormous, enormous celebration of life that he deserved to have. He was a longtime board member, supporter, writer, um, poet, artist, educator, so many things to so many people within the artistic community as well as in the general Black community in Montreal. He was a deeply faithful person um, in terms of his religious beliefs, but also a deeply faithful person in terms of his relationships with people. He has left us with his words and with his presence, with his influence and his impact, and we are forever grateful for that. We are going to go on with someone who knew him much better than I did and who can speak to more of that. Here we go. Greetings. My name is Maggie Metellus. I am a diseuse. Have been for like forever. Words are my passion, absolute passion. Greetings all. Thank you, Black Theatre Workshops, most specifically Liddy and Quincy, for inviting me to this poetry jam. And thank you for this section in tribute to our late, deeply missed and beloved friend, Horace Godard. I met Horace in 2005 through an event that I was organizing, and there was a section showcasing um, the artist Anthony Joyette. Jump to 2015, January, Vision Gala celebration, we met for a second time. And a couple of months later, specifically in May to that, that year, 2015, we bounded through this event that Horace, Nigel, Thomas, and myself put together. It was Cola Readings. It is now Logos Readings. And today it is my honor to read from the book by Horace Godard, Rastaman, Poems for Leonta, published in 1982. First poem, Azania. Have you seen my brave brothers lying in the tough trenches? Have you seen my siege sisters with upturned eyes of glazed death? Have you seen my deed-drawn father with marks of injustice carved on his shot soul? Have you seen my mother nursing noisily her prodent wounds wedged to Azania's womb? Can you hear the still cries of orphaned children sleeplessly looking for cold comfort from blasted breasts, bullet ridden? Can you hear the wailing moans, groaning calls for children who no longer hear with open ears? Can you hear fathers calling mothers, mothers' children, fathers all, the heart throbs of Africa? Did you feel the sharp pain that 
pierced cold flesh, lugged sack life to unmarked grave sites, potato fields of the rich. Did you feel the sweet death pangs of struggling babes waiting to be born from the blood-painted gutter? Did you feel comfortable when you saw injustice and power tear us from our homes? Did you, barbarian? The second poem is entitled Life. I think of my life imprisoned in a dead world, my life. Everywhere the grave looks at me, my blood boils. Is liberty a mirage or a war against us? I pause for a reply. Third and last one, constant ever. Closeted in a room with pale thoughts, my grandmother nursed her children childhood memories back to life. She sat in her mahogany Mahogany rocking chair Mm -hmm. and called over a century, reaching around in her mind for infant thoughts of a mother to her feeble 83 years. I eavesdropped on these private conversations. Well, self asked self a myriad of unanswered questions. When mouth and ears merge in accord with the spoken word. When brain unfuried whiplashed events and rushed them from id to failing superego. The rocking chair creaked with each uneasy floorboard in the living room. Grandmother said that her mother brought her up in the fear of the Lord. And she did the same for us till the holy words imprinted themselves on our porous minds over generations of instilling. Amen. Her pursed lips mouthed a silent prayer to Jehovah, who sat majestically on a golden throne somewhere beyond the pearly gates of a distant, ancient Zion. Like a transfigured child, child, cemented to a footstool of wisdom, I embedded her every reflection. Thirteen years ago, she died. One night since then, she came to me in the dead of night and beckoned me to follow her. Shrouded in white, she tried to stifle my lowly life. She wanted me to attend her on a visit to her haven in heaven. I declined. She left waving chest and hands goodbye. I screamed and awoke. Hmm. I was grandmother for a brief dream. Thank you.
Thank you, Maggie. Hi. Hello. Hi, Hi Dina. Hi. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Oh, I didn't expect this. Mm. Thank you. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's what that is, right? That's what those words were about and who he was for so many people. So thank True. you. True. Mm, thank you. Powerful word, powerful word. Very. Mm. Being, being grandmother for a brief, a brief moment. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's the one for mm. me. Mm -hmm. I am, uh, I'm a person who is obsessed with family history and genealogy mm -hmm. and and I want to know about the grandmothers, all of them. Mm -hmm. And so hearing that for me is extremely motivating because okay. I want to capture those words while she's still here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I will just ask you, mm -hmm. how much are you like those women in your family? And how much do you want mm -hmm your daughters to know and to embed of those women in your family? Hmm, what a deep question. Thank you. Okay, so I want my daughter to know everything. <laughs> and we are blessed because mom is still around, mm -hmm. thank God. Um, my aunts, there are many of them, and from the extended family also. And I was blessed to have my grandmother, my maternal grandmother around. We, I grew up with her in Haiti for my first seven years. And she was with us for almost 40 years in Montreal after that. Yeah. And yeah, it's a long line of uh, matriarches, strong women, willful women, and also wicked sense of humor that we discovered from my grandmother, the oldest. She got the, I won't say nasty, because it's my grandma, but you know what I mean. Okay. So, um, yes, and my mom, who is my hero, along with my dad, they might be watching right now, I'm not sure, um, is the embodiment of strength uh, determination, uh, steadfastness, is that a word? Yes, steadfastness, yes, okay. yes. Yes, and she has given us amazing examples and she still does, she still does. And let's not forget elegance, hello. Mm -hmm. See now. Uh, hello, uh -huh. <laughs> we were just waiting for the same moment to do our thing. That's weren't we, is. weren't we? That's what it is. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Tina, love. Yes. And um, so I don't, uh, did I answer your question? I, you I did. You okay. did. There was so much that we can, we, there's so much more about that that we can talk about. But I, I'm thinking about what Horace wrote about the grandmother. And I, I love that he, he made that picture very clear for mm. us. Mm -hmm. And it's just one I wanted to touch on with you because we all have these extended family stories that we're living in this so-called modern world and those stories don't feel so modern, but they have so many lessons. So that's why I wanted to ask you about that. Thank you. It seems that I'm frozen. Is I can hear you though. I can you can hear, hear you. me? Okay, fine. As long as you can hear me, but the I image looks frozen to me, but it's okay. I look good. You're in deep thought, it's all right. <laughs> you know, it's all good. Yes, dear. So yes, as far mm -hmm. as as far as people documenting those experiences, those that historical memory, mm -hmm. um, how did you find your place among those writers in Montreal or among the Horaces and the Clarences and all of the folks, the Nigels and all of these people who are the elders in our writing community still mm -hmm. writing and, and showing us how it's done, but mm -hmm. at the time really forging new paths for black folks in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So one of my many good fortunes in life was being having been raised in a household in a home 
where books, reading, was at the center of our life. Mm -hmm. So there were books all around. My mother and father read constantly. My father specifically would uh, déclamé. Comment tu dis ça? De, uh, déclamé. Tu sais, mm -hmm. recite by heart. Oh. Okay, okay. All kinds of text, literature, mm -hmm. poetry, uh, discourses from the Sina. Mm -hmm. And so, le milieu littéraire est mon milieu naturel. Voilà. Okay. C'est vraiment mon milieu naturel. Et j'ai, when I, as a teenager, I used to, you know, dabble in writing, but very soon I stopped writing. People to this day, think that I'm a poet, that I write. And I try to tell them, I am too lazy to write. Uh, you know, you got to accept the way you are. I'm too lazy <laughs> to write. And But most of all, there are so many other people who write so brilliantly and powerfully the yes, words that I would want to speak. And so my uh, privilege and pleasure is to put my voice on those words. So, pour répondre à la question, le milieu littéraire est un, mon milieu naturel. Our paths were, and as first, the first person that I met among those people that you've mentioned was Clarence Bain. So we go way, 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 way back, uh, like 50 years back. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And um, I don't know if I, did I say it in the introduction? So I met Nigel through a, a Mémoire d'un Crier. Because okay. his one of his books, or maybe a couple of them, were, was published, translated, and published by Mémoire d'Ancrier. So I met him at um, a Salon du Livre. Okay. So hello, hello. Harvest, I met through an event that I was organizing, uh, Poésie, Musique, Chant et Danse. And there was a, a visual arts part, and Anthony Joyette was the uh, artist invited, the guest in artist, and Harvest accompanied him. Okay. So we had a contact. I didn't know uh, about him or of him, but 10 years later we met again. And as and I think it's interesting to talk about how Logos readings uh, came to be. Please. So I'm at an event with uh, Nigel. Well, Nigel and I were there. And he, at the end of the uh, event, we were talking about readings and Nigel was saying, you know, he would like to put on readings uh, English speaking, French speaking communities, but he would need help. And I asked, what kind of help do you need? And he said, well, I know the Le Bassin Anglophone, but I would need help with the Francophone writers. And I said, hello. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's how we got started. And it was Cola readings uh, at the beginning with Cola magazine. And so, of course, Horace was one of the founders. And the first event, and Howard said, this is what Anthony, who had passed since, uh, have wished for, mm. for so long to have readings, poetry readings. So we dedicated our first event to um, the memory of, uh, of Anthony Joyet. And so that's how it happened. So the short answer is, le milieu littéraire, c'est mon milieu naturel. Thank short you. <laughs> and I'm so glad that it is. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that it is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, say bye bye to you for two minutes. Bye bye. Or maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should just bring everybody back. Maybe oh, we should okay. just stay where you are. Rana, would you come back, please? And Talia. Hi, Rana. Justin. Talia. Justin. Hello, everybody. Oh, hello. Thank you so much everyone for your work and your words. Thank you for sharing and for being so vulnerable, and putting yourselves and your, your ideas and your imagination out there as a person who consumes poetry, as a person who is an audience member. I appreciate this so much. And as a person who does this work, I appreciate the level of difficulty and uh, energy expense that it takes. So I appreciate you very, very much. Mm. May, I, may I have a word? May I say? Yes, please. That how the performances were so powerful and moving. Oh, thank you to each and every one of you. So, Rana, I've had the pleasure to hear uh, at uh, Logos Readings, but uh, 
Tadia and Justin, it's the first it's the first time I'm hearing you and I really look forward to hearing you and reading you. Thank you. Again. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Very sweet. Mm. I get to have uh, I get to have all of the attention right now because <laughs> we don't have any questions coming from our socials at the moment. Social media peoples, if you have questions, please send them. But for now, there aren't. So I just wanted to ask. Um, Tony Morrison said, "If you can't find the book that you want to read, you need to write it yourself." So I want to ask you: Has that idea to this point in your careers have that has that idea hit you? That thing that you're just like, I can't. I can't find it. I'm looking for this thing. I guess I need to do it. So I'm not going to ask you your personal project business, but I'm just going to ask you what what has that idea hit you and how does that feel to be like, okay, no, I have to do this. Any of you can answer. Uh, I'll say um, I definitely have found like it, it depends on a lot of things, but I definitely found that true um, to some extent where as an actor, especially one of the frustrating things is that you, you kind of have to keep on proving your worth to get into somebody else's vision and whatever the case may be. So that's why a lot of actors end up wanting to do in directing because it gives you that sense of control and to create the story that you're creating in your head as an actor anyways. And also musically as well, um, I think that that's a part of finding your voice in any medium of art really, but of finding your voice is, is realizing that you're everything that you're absorbing and observing in life, you then get to shape and whittle away to what is your own voice. Because I mean, we're all unique and have our own perspective, but nonetheless, everything that we kind of put out there comes from the sources that we're learning and observing about. So, you you tend to watch and consume so much until the point where you're like, I want to consume something that I haven't seen before and that sits in my heart, or whatever. And yeah, I found that's that's been my motivator to keep being creative as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to touch on that subject? Yeah, I think actually a lot of my writing and most of my writing is me writing to myself to better understand things. Um, so most of the time I write because I want to see what isn't there. So I write it myself. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maggie, Rana? Um, well, yeah, uh, I'd just like to say that, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, apart from apart from trying to write something unique uh, and feel good about being the first person to write about it, there's this big problem the world faces now is that every 25 years or so we forget everything, you know? <laughs> and we start repeating the same old shit all over again, we, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, there's this problem of regurgitating stuff, but you have to do it artistically, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, it's it's kind of ridiculous that um, uh, people, uh, you know, I'll give you a, a, an example. People n never heard about, let's say, uh, the McCarthy period. Okay, I'm showing mm. my age, but uh, you know, you got to bring it up again. You mm. know, people never mm. heard of Paul Robeson. You know, mm. Mm. what a tragedy. Mm. So, mm. so, uh, but I'm right. I I am researching something which I think in my head that this is the first time this is going to be talked about. Mm. But really, it's been talked about and it's just been forgotten. So, okay, you know. I think. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, I think it's very hard to write to write or create anything artistically that's completely unique because there's so many stories that have been told. And I think for me, what I've come to realize for myself is that not necessarily trying to find what's unique, but what resonates with me. Because it's hard to find a story that's gonna be completely unique. Just and sometimes it's fine if it's repeated over, you know, and over and over again because there's a reason why it's getting re repeated over and over again. Just mm -hmm. finding that way to bring it to yourself and align it with your soul and what you want to say, even if it's been repeated, is what's the most important. Is 
if it means something to you, then it means something. That's what mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. I, agree. I, think, I think that's part of our job too as artists is um, sometimes to regurgitate information that has been lost as, as storytellers and creators of culture um, in order to reframe it in a new perspective. And the other thing about even when you copy a story, your own unique perspective of life is going to shine through as long as you are telling that story in whatever medium you're telling. So no matter what, there's a uniqueness to it, even if the same fundamental core values there are repeated values that hopefully we, we don't forget in the next 25 years, but most likely we will. But, yeah. True, also true. I think about it sometimes like music, there are only seven notes, but there is always new music, mm -hmm. right? It's always the same notes, but there's there's always new music and, and things that have a clean day maybe to something else, but are done in a new way. So it's not necessarily a new story, but it's the teller that's new. And that's what I love about it. Mm -hmm. So I also wanted to ask you about your, your cultural histories. How much do you feel um, language plays a part, the language in which you tell the story you tell because I, I have this, this love hate relationship with English, right? It's, the, it's my first language, but it's really bitter in my mouth sometimes because of how it got there. So I just wanted to ask about how language and culture fit into the way you write and the things you may or may not talk about. I guess. I would say that, um, well, I, I fell in love with language in general as a kid, but obviously that was English for me and then French sometimes. But I think that um, I've always loved the concept of reshaping language as we move forward, just because it's what keeps it alive in a way. Like there's a, a fear obviously of losing languages to, to history, to time. But I think that, like, you know, the things that we called slang 20 years ago have now become regular conversational jargon. So it's, there's a beauty to know that everything is growing with language and hopefully we can redefine it in our own way over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, definitely. Rana or Talia? Um. English is not my mother tongue, uh, uh, but it's my first language. Uh, and so, uh, but I've traveled a long distance uh, in terms of being, I'd say, m more than bicultural, you know, and uh, uh, I'm more comfortable in English, and um, uh, <clears throat> but everything is associated with the culture you associate with. Your language is the culture you associate with, and the culture you associate with is also the uh, socio-political uh, mm. basis of your existence. You know, so. Uh, if you talk in clip tones and if you talk in a particular fashion, when you address down, uh, it has to do with your political thought processes. So language, uh, you got to be careful uh, the way you address your audience. That's, that's crucial. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I would say that's actually one of the things that um, made me fall in love with language and poetry when I was younger is not the actual words, but the way that they can be used, using your tone and rhythmic patterns and things like that, the way that they can manipulate different feelings and emotions while still being just letters and sounds, you know? Mm -hmm. It is amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. My background is in linguistics, so I love all of this. This is fantastic <laughs> for me. <laughs> Talia and Maggie, did you have something on the top on the topic? I think there's so many things that influence me in ways that I don't even know. And you know, it's like 
it makes me think of what, how different would I be if everything was the same, but my main language wasn't English? Would I be a different person mm -hmm. slightly? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just, there's so many nuances when it comes to culture, depending on where you live, who you are around, all of these things that just influence who you are in the tiniest ways, you know? And I was thinking about your question. It's like, I don't think I could answer that, at least not yet, because it's everything I've known. So how would it be, what would it be like if it was something I've never known, which is really interesting. So I'll think about it and maybe in a year or two, I'll answer your question. But I thank you for- love, I would love to have the conversation. It is very meta, right? It is very like thinking about thinking about the thing. Were you gonna say something, Nagi? Oh, yes, actually um, I'm fascinated with this conversation. And I, I wanted to go back to the first question. You know, Toni Morrison said, if you can't find a book mm -hmm. that says what you want. So this is, so thank you very much. I This is why I don't need to write. Because I find other people, you know, I told you I'm too lazy to write. And besides, there are people saying the things that I feel that put the feelings, the knowledge and everything else. And I can just put my voice to it. So anybody bothers me again? I'm going to tell them the book. I don't need to write the book because people have been doing it and continue doing it, writing the things that I want to hear. What Both you need is a ghostwriter. Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? I said what you need is a ghostwriter. Why would I need that, Rana, please? <laughs> I can me. answer that question <laughs> because all of us, are yeah. interested in you and your story. So if you don't tell it, let one of us do it, please. <laughs> are you really ganging up on me? <laughs> no, one bit. Not, not yet. Not one yet. Not bit. yet. Not okay, at so, all. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from social media. So Amber's gonna put that up for us. And I think that's that's where we're going to end. Mm. So on this question, if you mm. could tell your younger writing self anything. Mm. What would it be? Mm. An awesome question. Mm. I would tell him relax a little and stop worrying so much. Enjoy mm. life while you can. Have fun mm. with it. Mm. I'd say that time is running out and uh, <laughs> write more. <laughs> <laughs> All valid. All valid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd say write letters to your future self. <laughs> I think it'd be really interesting to have con conversations because um, I'm just finishing high school and my mom is like, Talia, are you proud of what you've done? And I'm like, eh. And then she's like, what would five years old Talia think of you? And I'm like, I don't know. And my mom would, would be like, oh, she'd be so proud of you. But I think it'd be really interesting if five years old Talia had written a letter you know, you could do it now. So I could, yeah, I will actually. <laughs> I will Please do it now. This Wonderful. is very good advice. Very, very good advice. Um, a friend of uh, BTW's and very, uh, very well known Montreal poet, Shanice Nicole, does that and has mm -hmm. advised us to do that as well. So, yes, good advice. Maggie? Yes, darling. The no. question if you yes. could, if you could write or give some advice to your younger Jesus self, mm. what, what would you say? Oh, but listen to your mom and dad. No. <laughs> it's like, you know, child, you don't have to suffer all that much. You know, you can just, somebody went through the path and told you, you know, there are rocks there. Don't go, you didn't have to go and very fast for your own self that the rocks were indeed there. Okay, granted, all of that made me who I am today and all of that, but, and I tell that to my kids and I probably will start telling that to my grandkids. Not, you don't need to try everything. Mm. And yes, because life is wonderfully good and because we stay blessed no matter what, something good will come out. Mm. of what happened, but you do not have 
to suffer and put yourself through pain and drive your mom and dad crazy and the rest of the family and all that stuff, you know? It, it, it reminds, That's it, what I would say. It reminds me of what uh, Iyanla Van Zandt says. She says, you cannot go the wrong way, but you can go the long way. Yeah, yeah, you can. I like That's that. It. Yeah. yeah. I want to thank you all so much for your energy and your time and your words. This has been beautiful and brilliant. I'm going to bring back uh, Lydie. We're just going to say our, our good nights and our farewells. Um, oh, and I, I'd like to answer the question. What would I say to my mm. Lydie, please, all right. for the question as well. I would say to my younger writing self, believe. Mm. Believe this thing that has been with you for your whole life. It's there for a reason. Believe it. Mm. So much to say. Mm. Yeah, as corny as it is, believe in yourself is probably one of the bigger things I would tell myself too. Mm. Don't yeah. doubt yourself so much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Nidhi, what would you tell your your younger <laughs> artist creator self? Um, it would be an arrogant version of what you just said. <laughs> um, instead of saying believe in yourself, I would say you're right. You're right. That thing that you think is you're right. Right. It takes a long time, and then later on, you're right. Mm. <laughs> All right. Poets, writers, actors, deezers, friends, thank you so much. Um, I, I believe we're going to leave it with you, Lidi. Is that what we're doing? Yes, but okay. thank you for giving me this opportunity to give my love to everybody and say thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you for sharing your poetry. Thank you, Dina, for this amazing event, this night. Ah, oh, I feel blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, that, was, that was so, what a wonderful evening. Such beautiful poets. Such beautiful talent, excited, all local, all local. Uh, that's wonderful. So I hope you had a good time because I sure did. I, um, again, dear audience, thank you for showing up. Thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you for supporting us. Again, thank you sponsors, Canada Council of the Arts, uh, Conseil des Arts et Lettres du Québec, Conseil des Arts de Montréal, Ville de Montréal. And again, thank you to our most loyal and generous uh, donor, Thank you, TD Bank. Keep on supporting us and may many more corporations be inspired by your generosity, TD Bank. Uh, if you work for a corporation, find out why they did not give us money yet. That's a way of helping Black Theatre Workshop. Uh, also, you can check out the Great Canadian Giving Challenge, which raises funds that helps, helps uh, Black Theatre Workshop continue the work, uh, our development of artist mentorship, um, the school tour program. So that's what the Great Canadian, uh, Canadian Giving Challenge, which is happening right now. Check it out. Um, and before we go, although I said thank you to the audience, our artists, thank you to our sponsors, I would like to take this little moment before, uh, as this is our last live event, thank you to the Black Theater Workshop team. I'd like to thank every single one of you who make everything happen uh, because for all of these events, for this structure to exist, it would not exist without the team. Thank you, Giordano Bruno uh, at marketing. Thank you, Princess Simons at um, Simmons, I'm sorry, Outreach Coordinator. Thank you, Christine Rodriguez, our school liaison. Thank you, Mariah Anger, Warona Sechuelo for your artist mentorship program, which is monumental to our culture. What's happening in Montreal would not happen without the EMP program. Um, Adele Benoit, our managing director. Thank you. Quincy Armour, our artistic director. Thank you so much, all of you, for your work. I feel so proud to be part of this wonderful team, part of this wonderful family. And thank you, Amber, who's backstage for bearing with me and working with me. You are an awesome technical director. We did it. Happy summer. Happy summer, everybody. Thank you for being with us. And we'll see you very, very soon, hopefully. Yay.